Opak Rof, Nyesai Ber, and Nyesai Duong. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Opak Roth, Buana Sifiwe, uh, students of Elam Theological Institute. This is Pastor Brad Abley with a brand new teaching in Old Testament survey. Uh, the joy of the Old Testament and its relevance for believers today. And today we're going to do a survey over the book of Leviticus. I'm looking forward to that. Most people aren't all that interested in Leviticus, but it is an important book nevertheless. And we hope to bring, we hope that the, we trust <clears throat> that the Holy Spirit will bring out uh, all that we need to know in this survey uh, from Leviticus. But I just want to bless you by saying, uh, Ruoth Ogwedo Ahinya Jotich Nyesai. Amen. Nyesai Mondo Omed Ogwedu. Hallelujah. Uh, and Kwom Unjogo Moye, we watch Nyesai Oti and Gimau. May the Lord cause his word to perform its work in you who believe. And then I also want to share, at least I want to try and share in Luo, one of my favorite verses that speak of, of God's willingness to answer prayer. And that comes in Zaburi uh, 116, uh, verses 1 and 2, where the psalmist says, Ahero Yahweh Niketch Noinju Noinjo Duonda Noinjo Iwakna Kane Adwaro Ketch Niketch Ne Ochikona Ite Abiro Luonge Kinde duto ma angima. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's let's get into our study on um, the Old Testament survey in Leviticus. And of course, before we do that, it's vital for us to first pray. So, would you join me as we pray now? Uh, Walem, Heavenly Father, we pray now. We thank you first that you are our God, that you are good, Nyesai Ber, and that you are great, Nyesai Duong. And we thank you that you have opened up your word to us, and we pray now that you would come, Holy Spirit, be Roho Maler, to open our eyes and open our ears and enlarge our hearts to receive all that you have for us. And let it change us and transform us to become more like Jesus, we pray. In his name we ask, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we are, we are in Leviticus now. We're doing an Old Testament survey of the, the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, also called the Law. And uh, as you remember, as you recall, hopefully you'll recall that when we, whenever we see the word law in the Old Testament, uh, law, at least law in English, I don't know what it, what it is in um, Luo, but sorry about that. Law in English is Torah. It comes from the Hebrew word Torah, and Torah is the teaching or instruction of Yahweh and that's why when the when the biblical the Old Testament writers speak of how much they love uh, the Torah what they're saying is they love the teaching of or the instruction of Yahweh, but really what that what they're also saying is it's they're referring to the Word of God. That's that's really what that all is. Now, um, so we're looking at uh, the the Torah is the five books of Moses: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And last session we finished Exodus, and today we're going to focus on 
Leviticus. Leviticus is a Greek word that simply means relating to the Levites, the Levitical priesthood. And in Hebrew, it literally, the Hebrew word, the Hebrew name for this book is He Called. He Called. And the reason for that is that uh, the in ancient books were identified by their opening words. So in Hebrew, He Called. But we know it as Leviticus. Now, Levi the Levites were the priests who were chosen of God uh, to minister to the nation. And the book of Leviticus contains many of the laws given by God to direct them in their work, that is the Levites, to direct them in their work as priests for the worship of God. The theme and the purpose of Leviticus comes in Leviticus 11, verse 45, which simply says, be holy for I am holy. And we see Peter uh, quoting that very verse in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, where he writes, you shall be holy as I am holy. So right there, you can see that Peter sees the relevance of the Old Testament for believers today. Now, before, so the directives uh, given in the book of Leviticus showed Israel uh, that showed Israel that they were the people were to walk before God as a holy people. Le Leviticus was designed to teach the new nation Israel how to worship and walk with God. And that's really the teaching of the whole Bible, isn't it? How to worship God, how to know Him, and how to walk with Him. And then secondly, how the nation was to fulfill its calling as a nation of priests. And so the great theme of Leviticus is holiness. You, you recall that in Exodus 19, I think it's verses 5 and 6, uh, God's... God's um, communication to Moses that the people were to be to him a nation of priests to him. Uh, but they rejected that. So God brought forward a, a tribe uh, the, 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 of Levites uh, to be his priestly people. So Leviticus really is a book about purification. Exodus tells us about the redemption of of Israel, Leviticus describes her sanctification. So first, God redeemed them to himself, and then having redeemed them to himself, he wants to make them like him. Nothing has changed in the New Testament. Once the Lord redeems us to himself, then he wants to sanctify us. And sanctification is that lifelong process whereby the Holy Spirit uh, brings us, conforms us into the image of Jesus. That is, we lost our, our, our image of God in, this, in the fall, in sin, and God, through the Holy Spirit, is restoring that image uh, of Him, and it's, primarily, and it's in Jesus. We're being conformed to become more like Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And it is the work that theologically is called sanctification. Sanctification, I think you already know that word, uh, but I will write it down here on this, this uh, flimsy little whiteboard. Sanctification, the English word sanctify. Sanctify means to separate, to call out, of the world and to call to God. And sanctification is that process, that lifelong process uh, that, that causes us to become less and less of our fallen nature and more and more of Jesus. Now, we were sanctified the very second that we got saved but that sanctification, 
uh, or maturity, that uh, maturation process, maturity, growing in Christ likeness, well, that takes an entire lifetime. Now, when, when the Father looks at us, he sees us positionally in Christ as saints or holy ones um, in Christ. So you see in the New Testament when uh, Paul or Peter uh, or any of the apostles are writing an epistle, a letter, they always, almost always address it to the saints in, and it could be in Corinth, it could be in Ephesus, it could be Philippi, but they're this, almost always it's written, the saints in Christ Jesus. So saints is holy ones. That is those who are called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So relationally, relationally, we are already, when God looks at us vertically, he sees us as holy um, because of our union with Jesus. We don't have anything within us that is intrinsically holy, but because that we are united with Christ, God looks at, at us as holy. Holy and so positionally in Jesus, we are looked upon as holy. So I'll just write here, Pastor Brad, because of my identity in Christ, I am looked upon as holy. But that is because of my union with Jesus. All right? So again, when the Father looks at, um, when he looks at me, when he looks at me, he sees Jesus. All right? So he treats me not as a sinner, but as a saint, as a holy one in Christ or because of Christ. Now, that's the vertical relationship. But then there is the horizontal relationship. And that is where I learn to walk in holiness. To walk out my new identity. Walk out my new identity. And this is what this is what the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament is calling us to do horizontally is to walk out holiness because I want to please Him and glorify Him and I want to bear fruit for Him as well. But the problem is that we struggle with sin still, don't we? So we, we oftentimes will see uh, the, the walk of holiness as a difficult thing. But God has provided something for us to facilitate, to help us to walk out holiness. What is that provision for us? The provision is simply this, and we're going to look at an Old Testament example of how to walk in holiness or how to walk in sanctification and um, see if I can fix this here and that is something called forgiveness you know it I know it forgiveness what what does forgiveness do when we when we ask God to forgive us of our sins what does he do? What does he do when we ask him to forgive us of our sins? Well, 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 tells us, doesn't it? And it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So 
forgiveness has a twofold benefit. There's a there's a twofold benefit. Um, number one, we are forgiven, obviously, and uh, we might might even say letter A, we are restored to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But another aspect of forgiveness that we often forget about is that we are cleansed. So not only are we forgiven, but we are cleansed. Now I need cleansing uh, from the Holy Spirit who applies the blood of Jesus for me. I need that cleansing every day because there's this sin nature in me that has to get flushed out, right? There's, it's, there's poison in me and it comes out, you know, it comes out maybe once a day, maybe many times a day. And so I, I not only need forgiveness, which comes through the blood of Jesus, but I need that restoration, which comes from forgiveness, and I need that cleansing as well. And the, the result of it all is, is that process of sanctification. That's, that's the result of it all. And that, that every time we ask God to forgive us and cleanse us, what happens? He wipes the slate clean. He wipes it clean. He washes us white as snow. Of course, living in Kenya, uh, you don't experience snow. But um, living here in Virginia, we we had a, a snowstorm recently. And when the sun hits that snow, it is, it is blinding. The, the whiteness of that snow is so strong that you can see why... Uh, the biblical writers use that imagery, or, or Isaiah uses that imagery. Though your sins are as scarlet, what does he say? Uh, let me let me see if I can find my red marker. He says this isn't quite scarlet, but though he says though your sins are as scarlet, so red, right? Red, red, red. This this is a good example of the corruption of sin. It doesn't look good, does it? There's nothing artistic about it. But but when we uh, when Isaiah says those your though your sins are as scarlet, he will make us white as snow. Of course my my eraser isn't all that good right now, but you get the idea, I hope. You have to use your imagination a little bit. Um, so so the benefit of the blood of Jesus is, is that it restores and it cleanses us. Now let's get back to how do we walk in holiness. When, when, when Moses tells us in Leviticus 11.45, You shall be holy for I am holy. And Peter repeats that in 1 Peter 1.16. How can we possibly be holy? Well, I think one of the main ways that we can be holy comes through confession of sin, repentance of sin. I believe that, that uh, repentance of sin is a gift. It is a marvelous gift from God because it restores us. It cleanses us. It helps us uh, to walk and to be like Jesus himself. Now, one of my favorite chapters on forgiveness in the entire Bible comes from the Old Testament, and we find it in Psalm 32. Now, one of the things that always astounds me about David, who wrote this psalm, is in Acts chapter, um, is it Acts chapter 13, verse 22, God says, I have found David a man after my own heart. Now think about this, loved ones. God 
when God looks at David after David is 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 dead, buried, and and then he's in heaven, God looks back at David's overall life, which was very messy. Right, David was responsible for Uriah's death. So in effect, David is a murderer. And David committed adultery with Bathsheba. And David was responsible for the death of thousands of, of, of Jewish people because of his pride in, in insisting that uh, his, uh, I think it was Joab, uh, do a census because his heart was lifted up of because of the, the growth of the people of Israel numerically and, and in terms of economics um, under his reign. And it went to his head. And I think it was Joab uh, pleaded with David, don't do this thing. But David insisted and he paid a heavy price for it. David made some huge mistakes in his life. David was guilty of many, many sins in his life. And yet, loved ones, the thing that so encourages me about David is that God did not penalize him uh, for, for all of those sins, but God looked at his overall life and saw that he was a man after his own heart. That gives me hope, and I'm sure it gives you hope as well, and that is a lesson that we find from the Old Testament, right? Uh, we find the life of David in 1 Samuel and in 2 Samuel and, and 1 and 2 Chronicles. Um, and then even in, uh, I think it's a little bit of 1 Kings, maybe not, but certainly part of 2 Kings as well. And then, of course, he wrote um, over half of all the Psalms of the 150 Psalms that we have, more than half of those were written by David. Now listen to what he says in Psalm 32, where he writes, how blessed, all right, in the last uh, segment, the last uh, video, the uh, my space ran out in my laptop again. Uh, I think I've got it fixed, so we're going to try this again. I was into Psalm 32, and we were talking about forgiveness, and um, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 32, remember now, we're talking about the Old Testament, and it's and the joy of the Old Testament, and its relevance for believers uh, today, and just look at how powerful the promise of forgiveness in the Old Testament is. This is David writing in Psalm 32, he says, how blessed... The Hebrew word is is in the plural, which means it's it's really intensive, and there's a great exclamation of joy, and we understand why, based upon uh, the rest of what David says. He says, "How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven." And we've already defined the the three words, the three Hebrew words for sin transgression, iniquity, and sin. And David says it is forgiven to lift up, to take away. The Hebrew word nasa means to lift up, to bear, and then to carry away. And that's what God does when he forgives us is he lifts up the sin out of us and he, and he bears the burden of the sin and carries it away. Isn't that wonderful? He says, how blessed is he whose transgression, outward rebellion, is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Uh, and that is the, the mercy seat covering uh, with the blood, covering our sin and washing it away. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Well, what is he? Why is David referring to uh, deception? David had deceived himself. If if this in this particular case, if he's talking about covering up his sin with Bathsheba and sending Uriah to the front lines of the battle where he would be uh, killed, 
David had deceived himself and he thought he got away with it until Nathan came and, and exposed his sin. David was living in self-deception. And so in verse 3, that's why he says, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. And so what we see here, loved ones, is that sin affects us, not just in our relationship with God, but it affects us physically and psychologically. He says, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me, and my vitality is, was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. You all know in Kenya that when it is hot in the middle of the summertime, that's not the time that you want to go outside and do physical labor, if at all possible, in the middle of the day. It's just the same way in Israel where the temperatures can climb way above 100 degrees, especially in the wilderness area. But David says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you, that is, I let it be known, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to Yahweh, and what does he say? You, verse 5, you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. So what we learn here, loved ones, is, is the power of forgiveness that, we, that, that the Bible teaches us about. And it's right there in the Old Testament. We've talked about forgiveness already, but I just wanted to emphasize that yet again in, this, in the context we're talking about um, holiness. How do we walk in holiness? And again, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so one of the ways, one of the most important, powerful ways that we can walk in holiness is through a lifestyle of daily confession of sin. Again, going back to the Lord's pattern of prayer in Matthew chapter 6, uh, he says, give us this day our daily bread. That tells us that the, the, the prayer that Jesus uh, calls us to pray is a daily prayer. And so then after that, he goes on to teach us, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And so I like to say that that um, repentance is a gift from God that we should take advantage of every single day. I, I don't know about you, but there's not, there's not many days that go by that I don't sin in some way, at least I think is the case. And I want to be clean. And so I know that it's not just forgiving asking God to forgive me of my sin, it's that when I ask Him, then the Holy Spirit cleanses me from all unrighteousness. Now, getting back to the book of Leviticus, one of the important things about the Le book of Leviticus is it teaches us about God's holiness, and it also teaches us about purification, sanctification. So, for example, um, it really, in a sense, the book of Leviticus is a book about purification. Exodus tells us about the redemption of Israel, how God redeemed them from slavery. Leviticus describes the nation's sanctification, that process of becoming more and more like Yahweh. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Doesn't mean don't do this, don't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. There is something that we can call, uh, if I might use the term, uh, a theological term of negative holiness. There's negative holiness, and then there is positive holiness. 
positive holiness. So there's really, uh, there's, there's a twofold aspect of holiness. Uh, you know, when, it, when we speak of negative holiness, um, we speak of the Ten Commandments, for example. You shall not, you shall not, you shall not. Paul often says in his epistles, flee immorality. Do not be associated, do not be yoked together with an unbeliever. Do not, do not, do not. Those are aspects of negative holiness. Not that, that a negative holiness is bad. Not that. It's not bad at all, but there's a positive aspect of holiness, which means to be like, to be like God. So when we, when we read in Leviticus 11 verse 44, you shall be holy for I am holy. That is being like God. God. So what we find, loved ones, is that holiness is a beautiful thing. Holiness is an attractive thing. We should be attracted to holiness rather than repelled against holiness. So I think that's something that it's important for us to renew our minds. How do we view holiness? It, it, to us, is holiness a legalistic thing? Do we walk around like this? I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do... Th That's not what the intent of it is. The intent is when we speak of negative holiness, we are speaking of we want to be like God. Therefore, there are things in the world that we can't be involved in. But positively, a positive aspect of holiness is that we draw near to the Lord and we admire him and we want to be like him. We want to think like him. We want to speak like him. We want to react like him. I hope that helps when it comes to uh, this important topic of holiness. Holiness is a good and beautiful thing. So it, it may have taken God one night to get his people out of Israel but it took the people of Israel, I mentioned this before, 40 years to get Egypt out of themselves. And likewise for us, getting Egypt out of ourselves, getting sin out of ourselves is a lifelong process. And it's not going to end until we go to be with Jesus. So Exodus related uh, God's act of salvation Leviticus, the lifelong process of salvation, the lifelong process of salvation. And again, of course, it's the same with all followers of Jesus. We're saved at one point in time, and yet the process of sanctification, that is becoming more like Jesus, lasts a lifetime. So uh, in this book, in Leviticus, Israel was to learn that a holy God can only be approached on the basis of sacrifice through the mediation of a priest. What was happening there? There was a preparation to show the people of Israel that apart from that sacrifice, the shedding of blood, there could be no reconciliation with God. And and the, the sacrifices had to be made over and over and over and over again. But, but Leviticus is a type. It's a preparation of the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, who, because of his shed blood, gives me wide open access to the Father every single moment of every single day. So, again, Leviticus, as in all the Old Testament, is preparatory the New Testament is the fulfillment. But we can never appreciate the fulfillment without first understanding the preparation that goes before that. Amen? All right, now, um, so the first part of Leviticus, chapters 1 through 16, deal with the issue of sin, and it addresses 
how the people can have their sin removed in order to have fellowship with Yahweh. A good way of summarizing Leviticus is the way to the Holy One in chapters 1 through 10, and then in chapters 11 through 27, the way of holiness. So first, the way to the Holy One. Second, then the way of holiness. And that really is a pattern in like Ephesians, for example. First, uh, Paul discusses in Ephesians 1, the way to the Father through the Son. And then uh, that's primarily in Ephesians 1 through 3. And then Ephesians 4 through 6, it is how to walk out that relationship. So first, the vertical relationship, the way to the Father. And then secondly, based on that, this is how we walk it out in Ephesians chapter 4, um, chapters 4 through 6. Now, the rest of Leviticus focuses on how the, how the people can maintain the holiness essential to fellowship with Yahweh. Gleason Archer makes the surprising yet insightful and helpful comment that no other book in the Bible affirms divine inspiration so frequently as Leviticus. He, he writes, under the heading of the verb to speak alone, the concordance lists no less than 38 occurrences of the statement that Yahweh spoke to Moses or to Aaron. So that, that's, that's an amazing thing. Again, the key word in Leviticus is holiness. Uh, the word holy, kadosh, means to set apart or be set apart. The Israelites must understand above all that Yahweh is set apart from sin and from sinners morally. Why is that important? Because all of the gods and goddesses of Egypt and of Canaan were all immoral, and they required no holiness from their people. How could they? Because they were immoral themselves. And Yahweh, who is the only God, the true and living one, is at his very core, infinite in holiness. And yet, there is something that is attractive about his holiness. Loved ones, we, we must trust the Holy Spirit to renew our minds to see the beauty of holiness, to worship him in the beauty of holiness, to recognize that holiness is our birthright. Holiness is what we lost in the fall. Holiness must be regained through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And holiness is liberating. Holiness is freeing. And holiness is to be like God. Thank God for the book of Leviticus. He is infinitely pure and infinitely moral. He has no moral flaw. His character is utterly perfect, and sin has never stained him, as was the case with God the Son, Jesus Christ, who took upon himself flesh and lived among us and was tempted as we are in all points, yet without sin. So that by virtue of us relating to him, now God looks at us, as I said before, and he sees us as righteous in his sight, through or in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Equally important about his nature, however, is his mercy and his love. So accordingly, Yahweh seeks to enable man, created in his image and likeness, to know him and to have a relationship with him. Now, so to solve the problem of sin, Yahweh graciously provides a solution for man's sin, and that is through the blood sacrifices of innocent animals without defect. So the the offerer the couldn't just bring uh, a a a lamb or a goat from his flock that was diseased and was going to die anyway, or had a broken leg and was no use for him. No. God said, I want you to give to me the very best of your flock. And then when, when, that, when you slay that thing, 
I want your hand on its neck so that you understand that by virtue of you laying your hand on its neck, you recognize that you deserve to be have your throat cut. You deserve to have your own blood shed. Basically, you deserve to die because of your sin. And just one sin would cause that. And yet in God's mercy and in God's love, he provides a substitution. And that's what Jesus is. He is our substitutionary, all-sufficient, atoning sacrifice. Isn't that good? He is our substitutionary, all-sufficient, atoning sacrifice. We were the ones that deserved to be on that cross, but Jesus stepped in there instead of us to take the wrath of God due us upon himself. And that was all prefigured in the sacrificial system that we find in Leviticus. Wow. Wow. So the sacrifices were meant to visibly demonstrate Yahweh's deep aversion to sin, the seriousness with which he takes sin, the separation that sin makes between the worshiper and Yahweh, his mercy and his love in providing a sacrifice, the blood leading to reconciliation and propitiation. Again, remember that that, that word uh, propitiation, which is a Greek word. Um, so the idea of propitiation in the Old Testament is atonement. Atonement. Means that, that the wrath of God is poured out, and once that wrath is poured out, the blood of, of Jesus um, brings the satisfaction of the penalty of that wrath, and it reconciles the sinner back to God, or the blood of the innocent animal. Now, in the New Testament, propitiation... Propitiation, which comes from the Greek word he lasterion, propitiation or he lasterion simply means that God, that Jesus takes the wrath of, of God that is due us upon himself and sets us free so that we're no longer enemies of God, but suddenly, the very second we ask Him to be our Lord and Savior, we are now sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. So He turns the wrath of God against us into the favor of God toward us. That is what propitiation is all about. And uh, you can find uh, the idea of propitiation and the very word propitiation in Romans 3, 23 through 25, in Hebrews 2, 17, in 1 John 2, 2, and 4, 10, and the, and the idea of propitiation is also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 19 through 21 where Paul says he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him in Jesus wow wow we who were his former enemies. Now, uh, Koro, we are... Um, <laughs> because the sacrifice was an animal from the worshiper's own flock and the best of his flock, it was a sobering moment when that animal 
was sacrificed, a sobering moment. Moreover, the worshiper offering the sacrifice had an, a sense of identification with the victim. You can see that in Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 4. Let me turn to uh, Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 4. Leviticus 1 verse 4. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. To make atonement on his behalf. You see, there's the mercy of God prefigured uh, in Jesus Christ. Jesus dying for us is the mercy of God for us in our place. So the, the, the one who put his hand on the innocent animal's neck understood that his own sin should really result in his own death, not that of the animal. Again, friends, all of these things prefigured the sinless life, crucifixion, resurrection, and the resultant reconciliation of God and man through Jesus Christ. It's an extraordinary thing uh, to consider. Now, um, uh, one of the key chapters in Leviticus is chapter 16, with deal, which deals with the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. I wrote that down before. Let me write it again. Yom is the Hebrew word for day. Yom. And then Kippur. Is um, the Hebrew word for covering. For atonement. So it is the day of atonement. And that's what Leviticus uh, chapter 16 focuses on. That uh, covers. So it became the most important day in the Hebrew calendar because it was the only day the high priest was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies in order to make atonement for the people. That is preparatory and a type and shadow to come of Jesus going into the Holy of Holies in heaven where he ever lives to make intercession for us, our great high priest. Um, so Leviticus 16.30 says this, For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean from all your sins before the Lord. But that was just one day. It had to be repeated every single year. Key people in Leviticus, Moses and Aaron. And then uh, Jesus in Leviticus We've already covered that many times already. Similar to Exodus, there are a number of types of Christ which are evident in Leviticus. The five offerings of Leviticus all typify the person and work of Jesus in his sinless life, in his submission to the Father, just like the animal is submitted to the Father, uh, that we might have fellowship with him. The book of Leviticus outlines five different offerings that the Israelite people were required to sacrifice to God. Each of these offerings carried deep significance for the people and pointed forward to the ultimate sacrifice in Jesus. So you have, number one, you have the burnt offering. The burnt offering was designed to atone for unintentional sins in general and it involved either a bull, a sheep, a goat, or a bird, either a turtle dove or a young pigeon, for those who were poor, without any blemish. The point is, if you were extremely poor, you couldn't afford a bull. But you could at least afford a pigeon. So everyone had to sacrifice an innocent animal. The worshiper presented his animal to the priest, but he, not the priest, had to place his hand on the neck of the animal and slay it. And this became a symbolic act of identification with the animal sacrifice. Now, it ultimately demonstrated 
how Jesus willingly sacrificed himself completely for us. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. If you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. See, there is a lot of similarity between Leviticus and Hebrews. Over and over and over in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is pointing back to the sacrifices that took place in uh, Leviticus. Hebrews 9, verses 13 and 14, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling, those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish, offered himself, we didn't force Jesus to be crucified. He offered himself. An animal can't offer itself. It has to be brought to be sacrificed. And it doesn't know what's happening. Most likely. Not all the animals. But Jesus offered himself. He says, no man takes my life. I lay it down of my own accord. He offered himself without blemish to God. How much more will that cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Beautiful, isn't it? Just beautiful. Hallelujah. Paul, no doubt, no doubt, had this sacrifice in mind by calling us to daily offer up ourselves as living sacrifices. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, a concept almost identical to, with Jesus' words in Luke 9, 23 and 24. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Romans 12. Why are we looking at Romans 12? Because I want to show you the connection between what Paul is writing and the, the burnt offering of Leviticus. Romans 12, Paul says this, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, your bodies, this is like a burnt offering in, in, in effect, present your bodies, a living, not a dead sacrifice, but a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or reasonable service of worship. And then, of course, in Jesus', uh, Jesus words in Luke 9, 23, and 24, what does he say? And he was saying to them all, if anyone uh, wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who who will save it. Basically, our entire lives are to be a burnt offering, if you will. But thank God we don't literally have to die. We just surrender ourselves and yield ourselves to the Lord once and for all, and yet every single day. Oh, the Old Testament is beautiful indeed. Hallelujah. The grain offering is the second offering. You can find that in Leviticus 2 and Leviticus 6. Uh, the burnt offering is in Leviticus 1 and also in Leviticus 6. So the grain offering consisted of either flour, um, baked goods with no leaven because leaven symbolized sin, honey or roasted heads of new grain. Now the giver of the offering dedicated the fruits of his labor to the Lord and it was done to secure or retain Yahweh's favor. In the New Testament this might be understood simply in terms of pleasing him with our lives. Ephesians 5 verse 10 says trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Colossians 1 9 through 12 Paul's awesome prayer for the church in Colossae, uh, he prays that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will 
in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we might walk in a manner worthy of him, pleasing him in every respect. So our lives are in effect to be a grain offering, if you will. This is the only non-bloody sacrifice, though it was usually accompanied by an animal sacrifice. Again, many see in this sacrifice a picture of the perfect life of Jesus. Let me show you that in um, the reference in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Hebrews 5 and verse 9, And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Now, there's a good example of how we can easily take a verse out of context. Having been made perfect, what do we do? Does that mean that he was born with the sin nature? No, not at all. Um, the very next verse, let's go back to verse 7 and look in context. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his godliness, his devotion, not because he was the Son of God, but simply because of his devotion. Although he was a son, he learned obedience, verse 8, from the things which he suffered. And then he goes on and says, having been made perfect. The point here, friends, in context is that this is discussing Jesus in his humanity. And the truth is that when we suffer and learn obedience, that does not mean we're sinning. We often think, because we're so used to sinning, that if we're suffering for some reason, there must be sin in our life. Or if we need to learn obedience, there must be sin in our life. Of course, that is the case. But there are things, tests and trials and tribulations that we go through all the time, and we're not sinning, but God allows them to refine us and to mature us. Jesus went through the same process so that we could identify with him, so that we could never be able to say, well, you can't understand what I'm going through uh, because you were sinless. No, Jesus suffered and learned obedience um, as a result of it. It doesn't mean that he wasn't obedient, but the idea is that he becomes more obedient, one level to another. Now, I, I have suffered many times, innocently did nothing wrong and learned obedience. Then I've suffered innocently through something even more intense. I obeyed the Lord and I grew into a greater level of obedience. In, in neither case was there sin, but in both cases, God used adversity to mature me. And, and where's my example? My example comes from Jesus right there in Hebrews chapter 5. Again, speaking of Jesus in his humanity. He had to be tested. He had to be tested and tried in so that um, his, his sacrifice would mean all the more. Then there was the peace offering, number 3. Um, you can find that in Leviticus 3 and in Leviticus 7. The peace offering was a voluntary offering of either an animal from the herd, a lamb, or a goat, and it was done to give thanks to Yahweh and to celebrate the peace with him that is brought about by faith in his promise through the blood sacrifice. What does this do? It prefigures and points to the New Testament teaching that Jesus is our peace. Amen. Can you say amen there? And that through him we have been justified by faith and have peace with God. One of my favorite verses uh, in the Bible is Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the first three offerings were all voluntary. They were offerings of dedication to Yahweh. The next two offerings, the sin offering and the guilt offering, were mandatory and they were for the purpose of atonement. They were mandatory because no one can come to God on his own. A sacrifice must be made for him to have access to God. And of course, the entire teaching of the New Testament is God provided that way through Jesus Christ. The great thing about our faith, beloved, is it is not our, the Christian faith is not our effort to get to God. <laughs> the Christian faith is God coming to us in mercy to bring us out of darkness and transfer us into his marvelous light if we are willing to receive his offer of eternal life. Number four, the sin offering. You can find that in Leviticus 4, uh, 4 verse 1, all the way up to uh, Leviticus 5 verse 13, and then again in Leviticus 6 verses 24 through 30. The sin offering, this offering atoned for the unintentional sins committed by either the priests, the whole congregation of Israel, a leader, or a community member. The type of animal that was offered depended upon the person needing the sacrifice. This sacrifice emphasized the need for atonement and the sprinkling of blood. Accordingly, it points to the substitution of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, our propitiation. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In, 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 in Christ Jesus. We are not righteous on our own. We are utterly dependent upon our union with Jesus. You know, next time you take communion, I would suggest that you celebrate your identification in Christ, your union with Christ, and the fact that the, 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 the juice that we drink symbolizes and points us not just to our for forgiveness, but to our grafting in to Jesus, our identification in Jesus, and the result of all that, peace, righteousness, eternal life, and, and on and on and on. Holiness, that is God calling us saints in Christ Jesus because of what he's done. The word propitiation refers to that singular act of atonement of Jesus, whereby he takes the wrath of God due us upon himself and turns that wrath into God's favor for us, moving us from the place of being his enemies to his children. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, how marvelous goes the hymn. Hallelujah. It's important to note that propitiation is very closely related to the Hebrew word atonement. I've already mentioned that. The fifth offering in Leviticus, uh, you can find it in Leviticus 5, 14 through chapter 6, verse 7, and then again in chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. The guilt offering covered a number <clears throat> of different sins. Uh, covered a number of different sins. Offenses against Yahweh's holy things, breaking his commands, or sinning against a neighbor. Along with the sacrifice, a person was supposed to make restitution, uh, again, specifically if he had done a wrong to a neighbor. Such restitution either went to God or to the person offended. And this shows how Jesus' offering compensated for damage done by our sin. 
Now, we run into a potential problem in Psalm 40, verse 6, um, where David says, let me read it. If you'll turn with me to Psalm chapter 40 and verse 6. Psalm 40 and verse 6. Where David says, Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. But then we have to go on in verses 7 and 8. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do your will. O oh my God, your Torah, your teaching, is within my heart. Now, so is David contradicting the Old, sac the Old Testament sacrificial system in Leviticus? Not at all. David rightly understood that Yahweh was not interested in mere formalism, going through the rituals of sacrifices without a heart for Yahweh. You see, that's the problem with the Old Testament sacrificial system, is it became just a normal part of, the, of, of religion. And likewise, we can fall into the same traps doing things without the right heart attitude. In fact, years earlier, Samuel rebuked Saul for mere formalism because his heart was not right with God. You can read that in uh, 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. Let's look at that now. 1 Samuel 15 and verses 22 and 23. So what does Samuel say? Samuel said in verse 22, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying his voice? We can go through the motions, but if our heart is far away from God, those sacrifices mean nothing. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is uh, than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Samuel what was, what was Saul doing? He, he was sacrificing um, animals before the people to make himself look spiritual, just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. And religious leaders can do that today in a number of ways, fooling the people. But we can never fool God. Never, ever be dishonest or manipulative or liar so that you can attract more people. Be sure your sin will find you out. We need to make sure that we please God and, and that we never become man-pleasers. And if you're guilty of that, if you've been guilty of leading people without integrity, it's time to repent and ask the Lord to forgive you and cleanse you and do some serious work in your heart. He who conceals his transgressions Proverbs 16, 20, will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. And my friend, if you need, if you've been guilty of deceiving people and lying and putting on a good front to them, 
but your heart is corrupt, fall upon the mercy of God now, but get someone to hold you accountable. Because if you've been used to doing this, it's easy to slip back into your own ways. So I would encourage you, the leader that is running the video, just to hit pause and take some time to go into a, a time of, of humility and repentance and confession of sin. I'm going to close now and we'll resume uh, Leviticus in the next video. But let me close in prayer. Father, I, I thank you for every man and woman, every student of Elam Theological Institute, and I bless them in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that this would be a holy moment, that you would search our hearts, Holy Spirit. Be Roho Maler, Njo Roho Mtakatifu. Come, Holy Spirit and search our hearts and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us be honest with you and turn away from anything that displeases you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, my friends, God bless you. We'll see you next time as we continue Old Testament survey Part one, the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for believers. God bless you.